Hello Georgetown, I'm Beverly Enos and you're watching Spotlight Georgetown. You can find us on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 in the morning and 8 in the evening. This is part of your cable TV, so if you want to become part of it and learn how to use the cameras or do some editing, we'd love to have you. If you would like to be in the hot seat over here, I'm always looking for people to interview. If there's someone that you think they should be on the hot seat, let me know and we'll make sure that we make that happen. Now today we're talking to two doctors, Dr. Colleen Collins and Dr. Becky Boyer. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. We're going to be talking about women's health. So this is a, a, a great topic for, for all the time, for, for everybody. Now, where are you each from? You're, you're Becky. Um, I work at Women's Healthcare in Newburyport and uh, Haverhill and Georgetown. But I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Oh, this is a, a different small town atmosphere for you, yes. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I love it. And how about you, Colleen? Um, I'm from Nahant, and I just started working at the Pentucket Medical Associates in Georgetown. Okay, for, so for people that don't realize, everybody knows where Dunkin' Donuts is, you're next door. <laughs> Correct. Right. right. Okay, so <laughs> now you have family in the area too? Um, yep, I'm from the North Shore. Um, I grew up on Wingersheek Beach. Oh, and my, nice. My mother and my brothers and family all live in Essex and Rockport and Gloucester. Oh, that's nice and close. Yep. And how about you? I have a husband and a son in West Newbury. Oh, so you live close too. Yeah. Now, we're going to do a little bit of history here. Where did you go to schools and what made you decide to be a physician? This is always an interesting question for me, why people decide to do what they're doing in their life. Becky, you get to go first. Okay. Um, I went to MCP Hahnemann in Philadelphia and um, and I did my residency in Springfield, Mass. at Bay State Medical Center. Um, why I went to be a physician, I'm not exactly sure how that all started. <laughs> Somewhere along the way. Um, actually, I shadowed an OBGYN when I was in college, and it was a very exciting field to watch babies being born, and that's what initially drew me to this field. Okay, and how about you, doctor? Um, so I trained, I did medical school at Yale, and I trained at the old Boston City Hospital. It's now Boston Medical Center. Oh, wow. I, I did a primary care medicine residency. And um, I think I, I wasn't one of these kids who always knew I wanted to be a doctor. Um, it was kind of an evolution. I enjoyed working with children. I had originally thought I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, and I, I guess I des decided I liked kids too much to actually take care of them when they're sick all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I backed away from pediatrics and ended up doing primary care. I get to do see a diverse number of people. I take care of teenagers and elderly people. I kind of like the diversity. Now, when you talk about colleges, you go through a four-year program, a four-year degree, and then you go for another master's, a doctorate. You get your medical, medical degree, degree. Medical degree. In four years or five years. And then residency for how many more years? Um, Mine was four years. I did three. So it's a total of how much? 11 years for 11 you, you years said. for me. Yeah, that's a long time to be head, heading towards a goal. You're working that whole time. It's not as if you're engaged, you're doing, you know, you're going off to work every day. It's not as if you're just impoverished while you're a student. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like you're, you know, an indentured servant or something. You're doing something you like. And you enjoy, you're actually so. practicing during part of that time. A good part mm -hmm. of that time, yeah. yes. You're actually being a doctor while you're learning to be a doctor. Right. Yeah, you're doing electives and, you know, going to cool countries and practicing and doing interesting things. So, Now, what cool country did you go to? I've been to a few. When I was in medical school, I was in the Philippines for about a year, a little over a year. And I taught in China for some time. Oh, wow. And then, because I like doing third world health, I ended up working on an Indian reservation when I was a res after I finished residency. So that's been a di diverse so you're not like uh, people have the impression that you're somehow studying all of those years in a classroom. It's much more like an apprenticeship. Okay. <clears throat> have you done any traveling with this or you <laughs> I did 6 weeks in Brazil in uh, in medical school. So. Okay, so you're an OBGYN doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how long has Kentucky Medical actually been here? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I think about five years. Okay, five That's, or six that years. seems about right. Mm -hmm. So both of you are in the Georgetown office at times or? At times. Um, my, my practice has two physicians, Dr. Chris Waters and Dr. Mary Chang, who work out of 
who primarily work out of the Georgetown office in the same building um, as Pentucket. Now it's interesting because both of you ladies have been in touch with each other, but you've actually just met each other now. Today. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always, it's always different. Now one of the things we're going to talk about today dealing with women's health, of course, is menopause. So when and what do pe women experience as they start menopause? And what ages? Who wants to hit that one? Oh, well, that's, that's yours, I of can. course. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so the average age of menopause um, is 51, but um, menopause is actually defined as one year without a menstrual cycle. So, um, so it's not a very scientific type of definition. However, women start to have experienced changes in their 30s and 40s leading up to this menopause um, and where they might experience some of the symptoms of menopause that we hear about. So hot flashes is hot a big flashes. one. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's probably the most heard about yeah. symptom because it really um, causes people discomfort when they're in public places and they often have, can't help but mention it. Um, but hot flashes uh, sometimes start before the actual menopause starts and, um, and then it, they increase in frequency as they get closer to 51. My business is uh, Japanese embroidery and I teach in senior centers. Mm -hmm. And I cannot tell you how many of the ladies sit there with fan a fair <laughs> amount of the time because it's the only way they can tell when it's coming. Right? <laughs> and it kind of goes from one person to the next to the next. Mm -hmm. Seems to be contagious. Um, how long does something like that last? How long, I mean, some people obviously would right. go through it much easier and right. have less symptoms. Some, some women are lucky and it lasts for a few months um, to a couple of years. And um, I do have some patients where it's never ending and they want their money back, kind of <laughs> guarantee sort of. They are wondering, why is this not ending for me? Um, but, but in some women, it, it can persist for a while, usually at a less intense level. Now, if women go on hormone replacements, does that stop the hot flashes type of thing? It's very effective at, um, at stopping hot flashes in particular. Um, the, as the hot flashes are due to a decrease in estrogen because we think our ovaries are not making it anymore when we enter menopause. So this kind of replaces what we don't have. But hot flashes are just one of the symptoms okay. of menopause that women experience. Um, insomnia is actually a very bothersome symptom that women have that they might not realize is related to menopause. Um, and vaginal dryness is another that, um, that can be, you know, related to other things like sexual dysfunction. Um, and um, bone density loss is another, another symptom that a lot of people don't actually feel or see, um, but it's something certainly important to them that, that changes around the time of menopause. Okay, and that's why they start taking bone density tests at about the same age. Yes. Okay. Now, leave that to you. <laughs> hormonal things that you that you recommend, hormonal remedies. Yeah. So things are a lot different um, these days than our mother's generation, where um, hormone replacement therapy. There were a lot of studies before that had showed a lot of benefits for women and thought that um, that it may actually help them have a long prosperous life and um, and about 10 years ago uh, there was a study that came out that changed sort of changed everything of how we look at um, hormone replacement therapy so hormone pills um, and hormone pills are just one type of way to get estrogen in our bodies and uh, now there's patches and creams um, and actually a ring, a vaginal ring that is used. So there's, there's lots of different ways for people to, to get their hormone replacement therapy. And, and not all women are good candidates for this. Um, some women actually are more at, at risk for heart disease, breast cancer, strokes, and, um, and should not be taking hormone replacement therapy the way we used to prescribe it. They just have to suffer through the hot flashes. <laughs> well, actually, there's some alternative non-hormonal ways okay. that women are um, that are treating hot flashes and things. I, I can mention a couple yeah. of sure. them that aren't hormonal, and one of them is um, SSRIs. The antidepressants have been shown to have some effectiveness in um, alleviating the hot flashes and sleep disturbance that go along with menopause. Really? Another one is a medicine called clonidine, 
it's a blood pressure lowering medication, but in, used in small doses, it's very effective at treating hot flashes and some of the sleep disturbance that goes with menopausal transition. Okay, see those are something new since, I, rem I remember going through the, all these things. Um, exercise, what does that have to do with going through menopause? Well, I can okay. tackle that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a, a survey of women across the nation, it's called the SWAN study, S-W-A-N, for survey of women across the nation, where they looked at the prevalence of different symptoms and um, problems during menopause, you know, because there's a lot of myth about what happens during menopause. And um, some of the things that happen is there's on average a four kilogram weight gain um, f when, when women go through menopause. So certainly exercise would help mitigate the weight gain that comes along with, with menopause. The other thing is there's a change in sort of body Pot body type or morphology, more women develop what's called centripetal obesity or weight Belly gain fat. across the across your midsection, um, and and there's a decrease in overall skeletal muscle. So, lifting weights, low low impact uh, weightlifting, and and walking and aerobic exercise would all help to mitigate some of those changes. And what about um, other alternative? ways to, to deal with it? Meditation or? Well, there's been evidence to show that yoga is beneficial during menopause. It helps both inc uh, improve cognition and also um, reduce the risk of depression. Okay, when you're saying improve cognition, sometimes... There's actually been evidence, that th this is no fun to learn about this I know. stuff. <laughs> Um, there's evidence that um, cognition, actually processing speed, declines during menopausal tr transition, um, but fortunately it's temporary. Oh, so, really? Yay! Yeah. It comes so around. when you have so senior moments, and, <laughs> and um, it, it's, it's considered f fairly temporary. But if you're feeling like you're having trouble multitasking when all the young kids out of college are, are running circles around you, it's probably because you are having trouble. Okay. <laughs> Now, you're a primary care physician. Correct. What types of, of people do you, do you see in, in your practice? Well, I have a special, specialty in internal medicine, which means I specialize in the care of adults, primarily. And, what I, and the kinds of things I take care of are asthma, congestive heart failure, um, depression. There's a large spectrum of things, um, are, you know, joint problems. Um, I'm, I'm a general internal medicine doctor. So then you send to specialists if there's something that's really specific that... Right. Primary care physicians do your annual physical. And for women, um, certainly if you're a woman primary care doctor, you see a lot of women. And, um, and then I refer to people like um, Dr. Boyer when I have women who, who have gynecologic problems. They need, you know, they need an IUD inserted. They may have abnormal cervixes or, uh, you know, vaginal bleeding that I can't manage. Um, gynecologic complications that are over my head. A lot of women feel very uncomfortable having a male gynecologist. Do you find that you have a lot of women that come to you specifically because you are a woman? Yes. I've had um, many women who've had terrible experiences back in their younger years and, um, and have gone for stretches of decades without going to see a gynecologist because they feel like it's the same as it was back in the day. And certainly this is now a female dominated field and uh, we like to think that we take care of, of each other in this kind of uh, practice. And so, um, so it's a little gentler um, and, and women feel like they are more comfortable talking about personal issues with other women. And you find that as primary care too? Um, yeah, I once had a, a woman come to my practice whose um, daughter had died, and she actually switched from another woman in my practice who was single because she thought, yeah, my being a mother, sh I would understand what it might be like, and hopefully I never understand what it's like to lose oh. a child. But I think people tend to gravitate towards providers who they think may empathize with right. what they're going through. Right, so when you, when you talk to the, to the patient, you actually know what, what it's like to be a mom what it's like to have those emotional emotional ties. Yeah, and I think even young women coming through college want to talk about birth control and options and speak to somebody who might have an idea what that means. Yeah. To I remember 
through the years, you always hear the, the jokes or the stories, and it's one of those, if the gynecologist could deliver this baby, then he'd know what it really feels like. Oh, yes. <laughs> that comes up still sometimes. <laughs> I, I can imagine that it does. What's the best part of being a, a doctor here in this area for you? Well, actually, there's a lot of people stay in New England, so you always hear this uh, this saying about everyone comes back even if they leave. So I actually, <laughs> I actually get to take care of, um, even though I'm only in women's health, I get to take care of different generations of the same family. And it's funny because some people refer to me as their family gynecologist and they joke about this when they come to Because you've to had see mom, me. now you've got the daughters. Because I have grandma, mom, and, and the daughters and things. So it's, it's kind of fun to to make those connections, and it's such a small world around here, so everybody, yeah, it is. everybody's friends with everyone and family with everyone, too. So. You have to be careful what you say in the grocery line in Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> you never know who's going to be there. Now, what's your favorite part? Um, well, I, I just got here a few weeks ago. I started seeing patients, and um, I was formerly the medical director of a big prison in Boston, so it was quite wow. an intense experience, a lot of violence and a lot of activity, and and so coming to prison or female prison uh, we had both oh, okay. men and women that I cared for and so I've practiced a good part of my career in the city um, and in urban poor environments and so um, I like the idea of being in rural more rural America and um, I came out I worked late a few weeks ago and I came out of the office and I just was awestruck because there was nobody in the parking lot and I could see all the stars in the sky <laughs> and that just doesn't happen in downtown Boston <laughs> and so. it feels safe too yep right and it yeah. just yeah it's a good feeling and, and I, I'm hoping that you can do more old-school doctoring in a small town calling people up on the phone and doing the old-school things that that uh, attracted me to doctoring one of the reasons I still have the same primary care that I've had since he had a practice in Georgetown probably 40 years ago, is when I have lab work done that afternoon or when the test comes in, he calls. At about 5.30, he calls me and tells me exactly what everything was. It's not a nurse. It's not a, a message on a machine. It's him. Mm -hmm. And he knows my history, and it makes, it, it makes a difference to me. Personalized. Yeah, yeah, and that's the type of thing. And he started at, at an office here in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. So, and I think you see that a lot in the small town type, type thing. Is there anything else that you want to share? No? Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. Congratulations. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Thank Welcome you for to Georgetown, us. both of you. <laughs> nice Thank you. Me. Both of you. And for those of you that haven't been to the doctors for a while, you now know that the, we have a, we have doctors right here in Georgetown that can help take care of you. So make sure you make that annual appointment and make that GYN appointment, ladies. I'm Beverly Enos. This is Spotlight Georgetown. Thank you for joining us today. Bye for now. Many foods contain a lot more salt than you think. Too much salt can lead to high blood pressure, heart attack, and stroke. Compare labels. Choose less sodium.